Good morning. God bless you. It's good to be able to join you again today, this morning, for prayer as we together seek the face of God and ask God for his insight and his direction. We do it out of a heart that's already committed to walk out what God tells us to do. It's so important that uh, we maintain that kind of spirit where no matter what, we are willing to follow through on what the Lord says. Let's just begin today with thanksgiving and praise in our spirit to express it to the Lord. Father, we bless your name and worship you this morning. We come before your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. And we're just delighted, Lord, in knowing you and in serving you. We pray that your will would be made clear in each one of our lives. In our human frailty, Lord, we misunderstand or we misinterpret so much. And so we look to you today to guide and direct our thoughts. Keep us as the apple of your eye, Lord. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. We delight in knowing you, Lord, and in serving you. We delight in lifting up our hands before you, God. We bless your name for your worthy to be praised, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be your name. And Lord, we do, we hallow your name. We know that your name is set apart above all names. There is no character no being with the attributes that you have. Your name is holy. It is sacred. And we bless you this morning, Father. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. We worship you, Father God. We pray that your will, your desires, your purposes would be made known in the earth. We are part of those, Lord, who want to see that happen. We pray that your righteous rule and your loving reign would be established fully in the earth, in the hearts and the lives of your people, in the hearts and the lives of those who have yet to be brought or convinced of your truth. We thank you, Father God, that you are present uh, to minister that truth. Or even for those who you've ministered to who have put it off or put it in delay, we pray that you would cause their hearts to be stir today many lives that we've uh, been impacting and interfacing with day after day week after week we pray that in these weeks that you've called us to emphasize our call to preach the gospel to live the gospel and all that we do that you would minister, Lord, to cause every person to know your favor and your grace. God, we bless you this morning. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. Give us, Lord, today our daily bread. We look to you as the unique supplier of all that we need the unique provider, the unique feeder. Give us, Lord, bestow in our lives what is needed. We look to you in a way that we do not look to ourselves or look to our parents or to our spouses or to our children in a way that we look Only to you, God, we just cry out to you, give us, pull forth, God, 
you are the producer. We can't even produce on our own what is needed. You're the one, Lord, who must permit and must pour forth into our lives. We utterly depend on you and look to you. We look to you, God, in utter dependence. Thank you for the creativity, the innovation that you grant to us. But you, you alone are the ultimate one. We bless your name this morning, Father. We reject pride and arrogance that tells us that we can produce what we need on our own, that we don't need to be bowing before you, but we do, Lord. We bow before you. You are the you are the uh, you are the unique supplier. You are the unique provider. Unless you provide, we will not have what we need. For our need is far greater than anything physical, unnatural. And so we turn to you today, God. No friend can do this. No network. No network of people that you've given grace to to make uh, and to have great resources. We will not put them in that place. Let only you fill. You indeed, O God. You indeed, we look to you. For our God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our indebtedness as we forgive those who are indebted to to us. As we come before you today in this time of prayer, we turn our hearts to you, God. And we forgive, Lord, those who owe us, those who've hurt us, those who owe us apologies, those who owe us in any way, we cancel the debt on their part. We will not be restrained by unforgiveness. He said, when we stand praying, we're to forgive, we're to release, we're to cancel debts, forgive us our trespasses. Also, Lord, even as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And we trust you, Lord, that you will not lead us into temptation, not lead us into the places where allow us to live in that space unchecked, where where there are lures and temptations to do evil. While you do allow, Lord, us to be in places where we will be tested, We trust you for wisdom. We trust you for insight. We trust you for power. To resist the Lord's logical lie. To resist the Lord's as they are prompting our flesh to say no to you and yes to the will of the enemy. We cry out to you, God. Be delivering us from evil and from the evil one. Hallelujah. We bless your name today, God. And Father, we do proclaim yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Thank you for drawing us unto yourself. Thank you for the life that we now have in Jesus. We praise you this morning, God. We glorify you this morning. We come amidst the holy angels that surround your throne, the seraphim, the cherubim. We glorify you for Jesus and his love for us, for the grace that has been shown us in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your truth, for your grace, for the wonders of your glory, God. Jesus, be the Lord of all, the kings of our lives. Jesus, be the Lord of all. 
the grace and the mercies of God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, there are a couple of things the Lord laid on my heart in addition to base. What we just prayed about, um, to pray for. Welcome those of you that have joined us while we were praying according to the disciples, uh, the things that the Lord gave for the disciples to pray. There in Matthew 6, I'd like for you to join me, please. Psalm 97, if we have time, we'll take a look at First Peter um, chapter 2. Let's start out here in Psalm 97. This particular psalm is very, it speaks of the Lord's power, of the Lord's dominion, and how his power so we want to emphasize that the end dominion or a minister really what I wanted to focus on. You know, sometimes we think of God's power and his rulership, that's what the word dominion really means. Uh, we can really be encouraged and very uh, strengthened by it all. And the psalmist here speaks to us about that power and that dominion, not only to encourage us, but also to to help us to be reminded of, you know, our responsibility with that. The Lord says, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the islands be glad. Uh, the reign of God is a very, very important thing. In the New Testament, it really truly speaks of, you know, the rulership and so forth of, of our God. This is a word that, that in the Old Testament, Malak, um, you know, the duck, Mel, Melik uh, is, is the idea here, and it speaks of kingship, or if it's a woman, queenship. But the idea here is of rulership, the one who provides counsel, advice in that rulership. You know, the, the old picture that we often have of, uh, of a king of someone sitting and that reign is located in a certain place, represented by the place, but it's really a person. And the rulership over the entire universe, or I like, I like to say the heavens, the universes, um, is in a person. It's not just in a creed, not just in a document. The closest that we could get to trying to express that in this country was through a document, the Constitution of the United States of America. But the positions, the viewpoints of all, much of that was drawn from the Word of God or from the God of the Word who rules reigns victorious Malak. And when we, when, we, when we speak of the rulership and the reigning of God, we're speaking of the one who actually has the authority to make judgments and decrees. In fact, those, those decrees Low out of the time of appraisal where God looks and weighs things. And you know, it doesn't take God long. It takes our judges 
along with the system that we have sometimes hours, weeks, months, maybe even years. But the Lord is omniscient. He sees things, knows them from inside out. And so his counsel and his advice, um, even his decrees, are very important because they flow out of perfect discernment. God never misses. Amen. He never misses. And so we can trust the decree because the decreeer is perfect. We can trust the advice because the the advisor is perfect. He's perfect in all his ways. Perfect in all of his ways, not just in his actions. He's perfect in it. The reason why God's actions are perfect is because his ways are perfect. His attributes, his characteristics, what's motivating and and um, undergirding the decisions, the the insight flows out of his character. And that may be difficult for us to grasp at first. But the Lord is perfect. Therefore, his reign is perfect. How can you improve upon perfection? You can't, can we? And so the scripture tells us it is the Lord who reigns. Yahweh, sometimes pronounced Jehovah. The Lord reigns. This word for the Lord means I am that I am. That, that in fact, well, Yahweh comes from Haya, meaning to be or to exist. He is, he was, he shall be. He t- the eternally existent one. Eternal existence. I don't want to get too deep here, but that's the the one we serve. The one who is, the one who was, the one who will always be. Is the one reigning over us. The one who will never be tricked, never be deceived, never misled. The one who will never ever go astray or abandon us. This is very important. He is the one reigning over us. The Lord reigns. And so the Bible says, let the earth rejoice. Let the earth what? be glad about it. Um, this is the word gil for rejoice. And uh, it's a word that means to dance in a circle. You've ever seen Jewish people dancing in a circle? Uh, the figurative meaning is you get so excited about good news that one person begins to break out in a dance, expressing their joy with vigorous movement, with, 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 with jubilation. And then they join. Because they begin to join in and turn around and around and around in their jubilation. So it's an expression of the soul just being flooded, flooded with emotion because of a turn, a favorable turn of events. Rejoice. Rejoice. Let the earth rejoice. Let the earth just be flooded. Hallelujah. Amen. Because of the turn of events, our lives have been saved by the power of God. And 
the grace of God, the goodness of God, and to respond in repentance and faith. And then there are other things that God does. Can you think about anything that God has allowed that led to eternal events? You were on your way to hell. Yes, we were. But Jesus came and suffered and bled and died and took our sinful state on, and more importantly, the the condition of that, the the judgment for that. And now eternal life is not just available, it's ours. Jesus said, rejoice, rejoice that your name has been written. There's been a turn of events. But can you think of something material or physical that's happened natural where the Lord turned it? His reign was expressed in him turning it for our good. Rejoice. Can you just take a minute as we think about it? Just give God praise for it. Deliverance. We bless your name. We worship you, God. We praise your name, God. But the judge was going to say one thing or the doctor said one thing. But God turned it. Hallelujah. Let the many islands, the Bible says. Yeah. Glory to God. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. In other words, glad there means uh, to flourish within, with inner triumph, supplied by the Lord. This is a mood oriented term, this definition says based on the inner awareness of the Lord's victory. There's a flourishing within because a person perceives that uh, he's in a superior position. And so there's an inward celebration. Glory to God. Uh, this, 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 this rejoicing arises or flourishes by knowing that one is on the winning side. Hallelujah. Do you know that? That no matter what you're facing today, you are on the winning side. Why? You're under the Lord who reigns. I meant to say that, that this, this name here for the Lord is the name that God used and attaches to other attributes other characteristics and his coveted relationship with us. Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is present in covenant keeping. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner of protection. When they would go into battle, they would carry banners declaring the name of that nation or declaring the characteristics. Victory. The Lord is our banner, signaling that we've already got a position of what? Victory. Jehovah Rapha, the one who preserves, the Lord who heals, both names of it. Jehovah Yeri or Jaira, the Lord our provider. We're already we're already in a position, a, a superior position because of the Lord. And, and in this case, it speaks to those who live in the island, places if you've ever been to an island that's surrounded by water, right? And many times they're very limited because of the land mass. It's like all, all the continents really are giant side islands in a sense, but we speak to the island because their resources are limited. Many islands. 70 to 80 percent of their income is based upon uh, tourism. I remember I was on the island of Trinidad and Tobago, those two islands down in the West Indies, and ships would have to come to bring food daily or even weekly. And if something happened on the sea and the ships couldn't get there, they were very limited, though they had 
sometimes rich soil, it was still very limited. It says, let the many islands realize you're in a position of superiority, superior position. Granted to us by the Lord's victory. The Lord's victory. That we're on the winning side. I wonder how many of us really believe that. I know we can hear that statement. You're on the winning side. And why we're on the winning side? Because you have the self-existent one. You have the eternally, we have the eternally existent one living in us. And he reigns. He's in rulership. He's operating in power and dominion over every situation, every physical situation, maybe a sickness or a disease, every natural, every legal situation that may be challenging you right now or maybe things are great, but you just are wondering how long it's going to be that way. You are in a superior position through your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice. Hallelujah. Be glad about it. To triumph means to win the victory, not by one or two points, but in a devastating way of this beginning. Glory to God. You are on the winning side. We're on the winning side because of the eternally existent one. Let's go on. Clouds and darkness surround you. This is the point that we're going to kind of focus on in any way. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of the song. You see here the psalmist is led by the Holy Spirit to get us to get get the right focus that the reign of the Lord Hallelujah. The reign of the Lord. Catch this now. Uh, it's, it's in the glory of God. The glory of God is, is, is needed here to understand how significant this reign is. What really puts us in this superior position? In the book of Psalms, earlier, uh, 18, verse 10 through 12 says, that the Lord rode upon a cherub and flew and he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place. His canopy, you've seen a canopy, looks like a booth. The, the, the shield at the top is around the darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies, from the brightness before him pass, the thick clouds, hailstones, and the coals of fire. This is physical language to kind of help us to understand. God is, is the master over all of this. Usually when you think of darkness, you think of ignorance, or you think of something bad, something evil, something murky. But God also uses darkness to help us to see that he himself is, 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 is surrounded. Surrounded. Look at Exodus 19, verse 9. Says, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I shall come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. And Moses told the words of the Lord, of the, of the people, to the Lord to begin to speak to God out of the heart of the people. Verse 16, and jump down, it says, So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were 
thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people were in who were in the camp trembled. Now, if you know the story, the Lord uh, appeared to the people of Israel there at Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb is sometimes called. And the Lord had told Moses to have the people to, you know, prepare for this meeting with him. And when God did manifest his glory, he did it this way. Scripture tells us that the Lord is an inapproachable light, but also God surrounded that light with darkness. And it scared them, right? Exodus 20, verse 21 says, so the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Right? Deuteronomy 4, verse 11 says, as Moses was relating what happened to the generation that survived the judgment of God, where he had allowed that many of their parents, to, most of their parents, to die because of their unbelief and failure to walk into them. In the timing of the Lord, into what God wanted, he says, and you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens. Darkness, cloud, thick gloom. Look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 22 and 23. It says, These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick gloom with a great voice, and he added no more. Moses was relating that experience, even though he himself would not be allowed to take this new generation into the land of promise, he related how the Lord originally manifested himself to their foreparents and how they rejected that. And so he's describing that. And in that description, we hear this reference to the thick gloom and the cloud and the great voice. And he wrote the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone and gave them to me, he says, and it came about when you, he's talking really about their four parents, heard the voice from the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire that you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. Very, very important. Very, very important. But back to uh, Psalm 97, okay? Verse 2, clouds and thick darkness surround it. We don't often see uh, any physical manifestation of the glory of God. But they did. And, and it looked uh, like darkness. And the it was so uh, gloomy looking because there were lightning bolts as well. When we look in the book of Hebrews, some of you turn your Bibles to that, Hebrews chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter 12. As the scripture tells us that we've not been called to that. Look at this. Uh, 18 says, for you have not come to a mountain that can be touched like they were and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them for they could not bear the command if even a beast that was the command touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I'm full of fear and trembling. He says, but here's, here's what you've been called to. So I just want you to see that sometimes when God manifests his presence like this, it is a very fearful and very frightening kind of experience. Daniel and others described that, that even when the angel of the Lord would sit to him, how his very body couldn't handle uh, the manifestation of God's glory in that way. Second Corinthians chapter 3 tells us, through the Apostle Paul, that 
this particular manifestation of the will of the Lord at this time, they're in Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. It's referred to as the ministry of death because when the Spirit of God manif- uh, was manifested like that, it came with the with the with, with the pronunciation or the declaration of the the ten words of the law, and everyone knew that they was guilty of breaking it, and so it's called the the ministry of death. It was the ministry and the glory of God, where the law of God was declared, and that law was condemned. Painting it with me on this. And so terrible, verse 21 of Hebrews chapter 12 says, was the sight that Moses said, I'm full of fear and tremor. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead a little bit here. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion. God manifested himself and his glory in that way at Mount Sinai to get their attention. Like he told Moses, he said, I'm going to reveal myself and they're, they're going to believe that I actually fit. And you see, that that generation of people, that group of people have been born and raised in Egypt, Egyptology, Osiris and Heth and Kenneth and so many other different gods and goddesses that were worshipped. And that they have been exposed to demonic occultic manifestations, satanic manifestations, the temple of Set here in Egypt. And so God proved that he was greater than all of those gods that have been worshipped there. All of those beings, which the Bible refers to as demons, spirits, I mean, no disrespect to Egypt, but that's how God refers to them, as inferior spirits, unclean spirits. And in that environment, God had to reveal himself in a way where they knew they were dealing with him and that his power, his authority, his brute force was greater than anything they had been exposed to. And then when Moses first came and was sent back, not just came on his own, was sent back to Egypt. And when he said, God says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. I'm going to bring you to Pharaoh. Pharaoh himself was thought of. He thought he was part God himself. His name also included that name, the God Re. And so he... Uh, he had to be shown that he was not part God. He was not divine. Many kings in those days thought that they were divine. See? God proved it to them. Through all of those plagues, every one of those plagues was against a certain God in Egypt that was worshipped. And all the others that weren't mentioned, they knew they didn't have the power either. But when God sent Moses back, the first sign that he that he demonstrated, not Moses, but that God demonstrated when Moses obeyed what he said do, was to create a serpent out of the rod that was in the hand of Moses. But it was called the staff of the Lord, the rod of the Lord. The serpent was was worshipped in Egypt. And God took that form to show them that he is the creator of the serpent and that the serpent that he created in his power could devour all of the serpents, all of the witchcraft powers, all of the demonic powers, all of the powers that created these serpents. Some said it was just trickery. And and, uh, those serpents were really there in the first place, but they were stiff and looked like rods. And then when they came into being, whatever way you put it, the point is that God's serpent devoured the other serpents. 
the message was clear to Pharaoh and Egypt that the power that Moses walked in came from a God that was greater than their gods and greater than their power. Hallelujah. And so why would God reveal himself that way? Because he, he wanted them to know and tried to get that first group, that first generation that, that, that he released from Egypt to, to understand that. That no matter what spiritual powers they had been used to, uh, at this point, hundreds of years after Joseph and them all died off, eventually they began to have children for at least 100 years or more. I, I want to say 200 years or more. They were now under the, the authority of, of the of the leaders in, in Egypt who were given over to idolatrous worship and demonic powers. God God revealed himself in this way. Yes. And he only revealed himself that way to liberate Israel. They were afraid. Right? He was showing them that he was greater than everything they come to. I, I, I'm trying to communicate this in a way where we understand that the God that we worship is the God of gods, King of kings, Lord of lords. There is no power greater. There is no character set of attributes greater in ability or in attributes in in actual character. And God revealed himself this way to them as he as he mentions back there uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it this way so that they know. that I'm the one that sent you, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God who really is alone God. They use that term gods with other beings, but they were not almighty. They were not sovereign. So he says here in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem and to thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions, perhaps billions, the word myriad tears is a word that is used. So it just means a number too large to count. Innumerable angels to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous ones made perfect. Of course, through Jesus. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. This is the one who raised. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, you and I have been raised up together and made to be seated together through Jesus Christ in heavenly places. In heavenly places through Christ Jesus. Where is Jesus seated? At the right hand of God the Father. And God sees us in him. Spiritually speaking, we are in Christ. Seated at the heavenly places in Christ. Hallelujah. Someday we're going to reign with him in a unique way. Right now we're reigning spiritually under his authority. And he reigns over us. Somebody bless the Lord for that. Give him praise for it. You are not under. Be glad about it. You are in a superior position. And though it may seem like you're cut off from certain resources in the natural. Through Jesus, the resources that we have are limitless. Glory to God. 
Glory to God. You may be going through a situation right now, a series of situations where it looks like you are limited. But the God who has wrapped himself in darkness and cloud wants you to know he is the unlimited one. He is the eternally existent one. He's already in authority. He's not trying to get the authority. He's already in position. And you are now under him. You and I are under him. So rejoice. Glory to God. Rejoice. Do a circle dance. My dad used to tell us certain things that he was going to do. Some of us as kids you would start jumping up. He hadn't even done it yet. He just told us he was going to do it. We, so we run through the house. Well, this culture where he was to begin to dance with excitement and vigorous movement. And it would form a circle and the joy. You know what? We need to form some circles and bless God in our spirit this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. For the Lord reigns. He's king over it. And there is no decree. There is no decree that the devil can overthrow. He can defy it. He can bring opposition to it. But no weapon formed against us will prosper. Hallelujah. Clouds and thick darkness surround them. The enemy can't penetrate. Look at what the word of God goes on to say. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of Come on, of his throne. And when we think of this word righteousness, this has to do Sadek in the next name. Melech Sadek. Melchizedek is how we pronounce it in American English. Melech, king of righteousness. Now, the word righteousness here means what is right, it's the characteristics. It's who he is. He not only does things in a right way, he's right. He's not wrong. He's never wrong. Um, This word means preeminently the approval of God. What is in keeping with his right standard. Rightness is in him. And so his standard is right. It's divinely approved by himself. There is none greater to approve what's right or or disapprove of what's wrong. And that rightness is what not only... uh, the attribute in which he created the universes, but it sets in order, and that rightness is what is is, is seeking expression in the universes. Now we understand a little bit better what happened with Adam and Eve sinned. They went contrary to the rightness. Yes, the love, that's true, and the holiness, but the rightness that's in God. And that rightness is what causes us to be out of order. Out of order in our thinking, out of order in our bodies, out of order in our relationships, out of order in our finances, out of order in the ecosystem, out of order. When righteousness is restored, we come back in order. In our thinking, in our emotions, in our relationships, in our bodies, Oh, glory to God. Somebody caught that. The scripture says that when the Lord restores, when the Lord restores, when Jesus returns and he restores the heavens and the earth, come on now, 
chapter 3 of Second Peter says this, verse 13. According to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which there it is. Righteousness dwells. Rightness. Because we are made, created, and made in the likeness and image of God, the image and likeness of God, the Latin term is imago dei, the image of God, image, imago dei of God. We have a longing for rightness, a yearning for rightness. We want rightness. We want stuff right. There's right and wrong. They, they've tried to get rid of it in the educational systems, the public education, and the secular educational system. I remember asking a question in one of the classes about 20 years ago about something being right, and the professor looked at me and said, it's not about right and wrong. It's about what feels good and seems good in your own eyes. That's not how God reigns. And believe me, everything in me rebelled against that answer because that's not how the human being is made. Saved or not, Christian or not, the human spirit created and made in the imago Dei in the image and likeness of God desires and longs for and yearns for rightness. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of rightness, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Until there's rightness, a sense of rightness with God and in God, there's not peace in the inner man, not just in society, in the inner person. See, the reason why there isn't peace in society is because there's not peace in the heart. And the reason why there's not peace in the heart is because there's not righteousness. The rightness of God is not established in the heart, in the mind, in the thinking, in the emotions, in the very spirit of man. So there's not peace. Peace has to do with shabon. All things are right. Not just about money and things. It's about rightness with the mind of God and the eyesight of God in our fellowship with God, in our relationship with God, in our union with God. That's the will of God for us. And so righteousness, let me quote to you, and justice, the word for justice is the word mishpah, mishpah. Hebrew term, means a judgment. Sometimes that word is also translated righteousness. Righteousness and justice are what? The foundation of his throne. Judgment. God's yes or no verdict. God expresses, one of the ways that God expresses his, his reign is through making judgment and judgment and executing that judgment. See? This word for judgment focuses on the moral standard, the basis of a judgment, more so than the process. Indeed, God makes a judgment on all our decisions. He has never been moral. This, this definition says here, God has never without some sense of morality. Everything God does come out of right and wrong. Everything. I taught our children and, 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 and nieces and nephews back when we used to have family devotions way back when they were still kids, teenagers and young and, and, and uh, uh, young, you know, tweens and children. God is right. He's never wrong. I got that from the word. And right is right if nobody believes it. Wrong is still wrong if nobody does it. See, right and wrong don't, don't come into existence based upon our feelings and how we think about things. God is right, and God's eternal. He never ceases to be right because he missed something. And what he endorses is what's right, and what he doesn't approve of it's what's 
wrong. Why? Because right leads to life. Right leads to peace, wholeness. Peace leads to joy. Got that? That's in his kingdom. Wrong leads to confusion and disorder and every evil practice. The judges of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, Psalm 19 says. And so righteousness and justice are the foundation. The home base, this definition says, the center of operation. It's the basis upon which everything functions in God. You say, well, I thought it was love. It is love. But in this text, it's just speaking as well about the part of the foundation that is in righteousness and justice. God never does anything out of out of a whim. It flows out of his love, out of his grace, out of his holiness, and in this context, out of his righteousness, out of his wisdom. You know how the scripture says in James chapter 3, that the wisdom that comes from above, from God, is first of all peaceable. It has this big list. Let me close with that, because I'm not going to get to the other passage, but we can close with that in pray. James chapter 3. Let's look at that. Look at this verse 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy or jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom that is expressed in what? Bitter envy and selfish ambition and arrogance and lies is is not that wisdom which comes down from above, but is earthly and natural or sensual and demonic for where jealousy and selfish ambition exists. Some of the versions may read envy. It's a zeal that bubbles forth a hot boiling heat is the word. It's jealous. It just says it's as cruel as the grave. Now, when it's used in reference to God, it means an enthusiastic devotion because God's not cruel. This hot boiling passion can be expressed in, in a kind of evil or it can be expressed uh, in, a, in a zeal for God. Where, where jealousy is, it, in this sense, it's an unprincipled action. It's self-directed, right? We're going to pray. And selfish ambition. Selfish ambition means a, a, a driving sense of discord and strife. And it's always about you and what you want to have. It's self-interest. This wisdom does not come from above. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is what? Disorder. And every evil thing. Right? There's instability. Every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness. And that word is it's sown in peace by those who make peace. Who are the people that are make peace? Those that are walking in the wisdom from God. Who are those that are walking in the wisdom from God? Those that are yielding to the to the righteousness and the justice of the Lord. And then when Jesus talked about the type, he said that. You should tithe, but don't leave off the way of that. Justice. But that the foundation of his throne. Rightness. Mercy. Faithfulness. The love of God. You gotta pray. The Bible says in first Peter 
chapter 2, the Lord Jesus, even when he was reviled, even when he was, I said that was the last one. Let me let me do this and close it there because I just keep getting this prompting to go there. First Peter chapter 2, the Bible tells us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to follow his example. He left us with an example for us to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. See, rightness. And while being reviled, the word reviled means when somebody says something harsh to you or about you in a mean-spirited way, in an insulting and a demoralizing, humiliating way, it means to speak abusively. Who, when being reviled, all that happened, he didn't return with that. He didn't revile. He didn't come back in a corresponding, denigrating way with people. Right that? But in return, while suffering, he uttered no threats. I'm going I'm to kill you. I'm going to get you. But he kept, the tense in which this is written, he kept entrusting himself. That was his pattern. He kept turning himself over. Delivering himself over with a sense of close involvement. He kept committing himself to him who, what, judges, how important righteousness is, to him who judges righteousness. God's making the right decision, even when you're being reviled, even when you're being uh, threatened, even when you are suffering. Don't respond in the same spirit of the enemy or the ones through whom the enemy is working. Respond like Jesus. You don't even respond necessarily to the people first. The first response is to God who judges righteously. And that's usually where we struggle in it. God, why do you let this happen? Because judgment always involves a decision. God, you had to decide to let this happen. The enemy can't just do this kind of stuff. You're letting this happen to me and around me. That decision to let that happen came out of an appraisal process. A judgment was made. A judgment means that God went through an appraisal process. The one who reigns judges righteously. The whole judgment process like I just tried to share with you 20 minutes ago or so, involved, not, it didn't take God a week to see that this was right, to let this, these things happen, or let us have to go through this reliably. Bear in mind that the weapon, though it's been formed, it will not prosper. It doesn't say it won't be hurled against you. It says it won't prosper. It doesn't even always say it won't land, but it won't prosper. When it lands, it will not prosper in the in the thing for which it was said. You know what will prosper? The word of the Lord expressed through the decrees of God. The Lord reigns. You're already in a superior position. Oh, glory to his name. And if the Lord is allowing it to be formed, no, he's already condemned it while it's being formed. If the Lord allows it to be hurled, no, you're in a superior position. Some of them won't even get to you. But the few that do get to you, that land at your doorstep, land on your door, it's going to hit that shield of faith. Glory to God. Praise the name of Jesus, and it will be extinguished. Glory to the Lamb of God. If the Lord lets it land, the, the purpose for the enemy sending it will not be fulfilled. No weapon formed against you will succeed. succeed. You say, look like it's succeeding to me. My door is burning. My lawn is burning. No, 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 no. It will not accomplish the full purpose that the enemy had for setting it, taking you out. Your family and your, your, your descendants not ever knowing God and walking with God, it will not succeed through it all. If you will yield that thing over to God, look at what it says here. 
Christ direct them. Praise the name of Jesus. Keep entrusting to him the one who judges righteously. The one who judges righteously. I'm finished. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. He went on through what was hurled against him so that we might so that he, we might die to sin and live under righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Spiritually speaking, and we have some manifestations of that physically. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the bishop, the guardian of your soul. Glory to God. That weapon came, but it wasn't able to take out your soul. Wasn't able to take out your understanding in, in your soul. Allah, what I wish it above all things, that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Are you prospering in your soul? How do you know you're prospering? You understand that you are in a superior position and that you are under the reign of one who is perfect and righteous in all of his decisions. And that the Lord, if he's allowing the weapons of the enemy, to be released against your life and a few of them to land. Come on. Not all of them are landing. That shield is blocking you. Come on. It's blocking the shield of faith. It's blocking. Don't get shook by the fact that the, that the missile is hitting the shield. Don't lose it because the Lord is letting the missile hit the shield. Rejoice. Rejoice. You know, some of us don't even want to go through any part of the warfare. That's not the way it is. You're going to hear, you're going to hear that missile from the enemy. Lift up the shield of faith. It's going to land at your feet, but it's not going to take you out. That's the understanding. The Lord reigns. And he's making some decisions to let some stuff happen that shakes your house a little bit. Shakes you a little bit. But it will not prosper. You're still alive. You still can move forward. You still are advancing. You still, come on, glorify God. I feel the anointing of God right now. You still are going through. If you're at the place in your life where you just don't ever even want to hear the bombs go off, grow up. Wake up. It's a part of the warfare. But God, who is your strength and shield, will get you through this until it's time for your life to be taken out on the earth. Until then, glorify God. Until then, magnify God. Until then, praise him anyway. Until then, know that no weapon formed is going to prosper in the way and for the reasons that the enemy sent it. Until then, glorify him when every bomb drops at your feet. Until then, glorify him even though he's bringing you through the flames of the bombs that are dropping around you. Until then, glorify him that your children are still hearing the word of the Lord. Until then, glorify God that your spouse is still seeing you go through through the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Until then, glorify God in the midst of it that you're watching your spouse come through by the hand of the Lord. Until then, glorify God that your neighbors and your friends are seeing you walk through the flames of fire, through the lion's den. Until then, glorify God that the church of Jesus Christ is arriving to walk in the newness of life. Until then, glorify that God that God is keeping you in your apartment, keeping you in your house, even though you still don't have all the money that you need. Until then, glorify God that the, that the doctor will not be able to give the final word over your body. Until then, glorify God that the attorney and the judge is not going to have the last word. Until then, even if your son is in prison, God is going to bring him through. Until then, glorify God, glorify God, magnify God that the shepherd and the bishop over your soul is keeping you from losing your mind. Until then, glorify God, magnify God. Keep entrusting yourself. Keep giving yourself over, yielding yourself over to the care of the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. Don't complain about what he's allowing you to go through. Glorify God that he's protecting you and taking you through. 
that the enemy is not able to see his vision come to pass in your life. Jesus is getting the glory. He's not just getting the glory with you on the beach. He's getting the glory with you in the midst of the fiery furnace. That you and I live as a testimony unto his righteousness. That your faith is praising God, bringing glory to God in righteousness. Oh, God, we bless you this morning. We praise you this morning. Come on, take you that are left on the line. Take what the Lord is allowing you to go through and say, I'm going to, I yield myself. I'm entrusting myself. The word entrusting is I put myself in your care. I'm entrusting myself in your care. Some of us are still shaky over the Lord's care because we don't like the way he cares for us. We want him to care for us the way we want to be cared for. We don't want there to be any bombs. We don't want there to be any shakiness. We don't want there to be any tremors. But that's not reality. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Even through the near misses. The other day we were driving uh, in the car and we had a near miss. We can live in fear after the near miss or we can live in the glory. Thank you, God. You brought us through. You brought us through. You were there. You took care of us. Choose. You can choose to live in the fear of what could have been or live in the glory of what God didn't let happen. Come on, bless the Lord. Be careful next time. Be more careful next time. Fine. But sometimes you can be as careful as all get out and get rear-ended. Come on. Bless the Lord. He is the shepherd and the guardian over your soul. Who am I talking to this morning by the power of the Holy Ghost? Don't live in the fear. The Lord has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Why? Because the Lord reigns. Be glad. Be glad about it. You're in a superior position. He's only going to let the enemy get as close as he wants to let him. And when he does, if you trust him, if we trust him, if we trust him, he's going to get the glory. And the enemy is going to have to walk away in shame. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I know it looks ugly right now. I know it looks bad right now. But the enemy is going to be shamed. Praise the name of Jesus. Like Janice and Jambres, Paul said in Second Timothy chapter three, they're going to be they're going to be reproved. They're going to be shamed when Moses left. When Moses left Egypt with 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 Israel, they were in Pharaoh were shamed. Oh, it is God. All of his counselmen were shamed because the Lord would not let anything that the enemy said prosper. Father, we thank you. We thank you for bringing shame to the enemy. Come on, some of you are not seeing the picture right. You're seeing the enemy insulting you and reviling you and humiliating, humiliating you, but that's not the end of the story. That's momentary shame. What God is going to do is bring eternal shame to the enemy. Glory to God. Eternal shame. We bless the name. Uh, this is for somebody this morning. We bless the name of Jesus. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's what I heard by as I prayed in tongues. Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. He delights in the law of the Lord. And his law, he meditates day and night. Ah, glory to God. His leaves shall not wither. His tree, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaves shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. The rain comes, the drought comes, but you will prosper. The word means to expand, to excel, to go beyond your boundaries. Prosperity is in God. It's in you. It's not money. It's in you. Let him prosper you the way he wants to prosper you. Oh, that's why the apostle said that. Ah, it does my heart good to see that my children are walking in the truth, that you're prospering in your soul. Let your soul, let your understanding, that's your soul, your emotions prosper. Prosper in knowing, knowing rest and knowing 
that he reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord Satan, of the Lord rebukes you. Offer the understanding. Offer the emotional stability that you want in your people. Move. Get away. The Lord Christ rebukes you. The blood of Jesus prevails against you. We will not live in the fear of would have been, what could have been. We will not live in that fear and try, try always with our with our hands gripped to the steering wheel of life, trying to make sure that we don't have any accidents. We reject the spirit of fear in the name of for the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but his power of love, soundness of mind. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody bless God with me today. We praise you, Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Come on, just unmute yourself for a minute. Let's praise the name of Jesus. We bless you this morning. We praise you this morning. We magnify you this morning. Great and awesome are you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word. The lamp to our feet. A light into our path. We hide it in our heart. That we may not say, thank you for what you're doing over this city, Lord. We praise you. You reign over St. Over Louis. Let's go back. Lord, you reign over my heart. You reign in my heart and over my heart. You reign in my relationships, over my relationships, in my marriage, in my family. If you're not married, in my household. You reign over my children. You reign in the home and outside the home. We accept your divine decrees, God. We just entrust ourselves to you in the midst of all the reviling and the threats of the enemy. We entrust ourselves. We get close to you, God. We trust your decision-making process, and we trust your decisions because it comes out of the rightness of God, out of the love of God, out of the holiness of God, out of the truthfulness of God. We praise you this morning. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. We trust you now for wisdom, understanding, to make the right steps in the midst, even especially in this in-between place, in between where we were and where we're headed. God, we trust you for wisdom, for favor. Let God speak to your spirit. If you have ideas, get concepts, who to call, where to go. You may not like them. You may not even, you may have to look up their name. You have to find a department to do what God puts in your spirit to do it's a part of the decree of God it's a part of the judgment of the Lord it's it's his you know sometimes when a when a judge gives judgment he said now you need to do you're gonna to have to do this you have to stay here you have to wear this you have to do such and such you have to report here just follow whatever those steps are the Holy Spirit gives. God may lead you to somebody that will lay it out even more for you but obey the word of the Lord don't just leave it here feeling better about it and letting it sit looking like Expecting God to do it all. Follow what the Lord says. Do next. Praise the name of many of you. I just sense to say this as well. Rehearse the word of the Lord in your spirit. I will not live in the spirit of fear. For the Lord did not give that to me. But the power of love and of sound judgment. Soundness of mind. Soundness of mind is in the Holy Ghost. It's in the spirit of the Lord. It's not in your ability to just keep your thoughts and keep your emotions intact. It's in the Lord. Meditate on the Lord. Meditate on this word. Draw from the spirit of the Lord. Pull on his nature. Pull on his character. Pull on his grace. Receive it. You don't have to pull on it. We're, we're, we're the, he's divine. We're the branches. That, that sap is just flowing into these branches. Just suck it in. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the sap of the Holy Ghost. In the sap is the strength. In the sap are the nutrients. In the sap is what we need. We receive it. We receive it. Tell the Lord, I receive the sap of the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of us have been receiving sap from other places. You don't need the other sap of the world. We need the sap of the Spirit, the sap that's in the vine. That's the word of the Lord. That's the Spirit of the Lord. That's the grace of God. That's the fruit of that's the that's that's the that's the nutrients that produces uh the fruit. Praise the name of Jesus. He produces, we bear it. Come on, somebody. What he produces, we just let it come on through us and let it hang on us. Father, we thank you for it in the midst of it all. But I just said some right now, some of us right now, the Lord is requiring that you walk through the fiery furnace, that you go through the lion's den. I know it looks like the lions are going to get you, but they're not. The lion's jaws are locked. They're locked. They're locked. 
those lions are sitting there waiting on the ones that it will be given the authority to devour. It hasn't been given the authority. These things haven't been given the authority to burn you or to devour you. Bless the Lord in the midst of it. Bless the Lord in the midst of it. Right here in this place, in, the, in this, this scary place in the in-between, bless him right here. Praise him right here. Thank you, Jesus. Call who the Lord says call. Consult who the Lord says consult. Go to the place that the Lord says go to. Sit down. Settle down. Ask questions. Weigh the answers by the Spirit. You will know God will give you peace about what is right, what sits with his rightness. Father, we thank you for your word. We bless you now. And Lord, we pray this for the, for the leaders of our city, for the leaders of our state, for the leaders of our nation. We pray for rightness, the sense of what's right to you and not just what's right in each other's eyes what's right according to philosophy and the history of the world. And Father, we pray for the sense of rightness that only you can bring. I pray you continue to raise up pastors and preachers and evangelists and apostles and prophets, teachers of the word and helpers, the body of Christ, to walk in the rightness of God, in the rightness, the righteousness of God. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for this decision that was made to denounce abortion. And I pray in the midst of all that's going on at the state level that the rightness of God would somehow be perceived by the Holy Ghost and that we would not just do what's right in our eyes, but we would do what's right in your eyes. In the name of the Lord, Rashakarara, give the judges wisdom. In the name of beyond their years, beyond their learning, I pray that a sense of rightness would be released in the nation. We receive that rightness and receive by the Holy Ghost. We know you don't violate people's will and choice, but I pray that our will, the will of the nation, would be so impacted by the presence of the Lord, by the grace, by the conviction of the Spirit, that it would just seem right in the eyes, even of unbelievers, to protect the unborn. In the Kadabra, we come against the will of the enemy, the rightness that's in the eyes of the enemy, that sense of rightness that comes from hell, that it would be exposed and overthrown, Lord, and that behind the scenes, others that are, that are manipulating what's right, that come with the devil's sense of rightness, the devil's wisdom, with the wisdom that doesn't come from above, we pray that it would be exposed and trounced in this generation. We pray for the rightness of God, for the righteousness of God to be revealed, to be understood in spite of the plans of the enemy for, for 200 years of this nation alone or more. Overthrow it, God, and the nations of the earth that the kingdom of God and righteousness and peace and joy and all the ghosts would be expanding like never before. Take it in. Glory to Jesus. Let it be so, Lord. In our hearts, in our homes, in our hoods. In the name of Jesus. We pray for Mr. Biden. We pray for his cabinet. We pray for the senators. We pray for the congressmen and women. In the, that the rightness of God would overshadow them, would overcome them. In the name of the Lord Jesus. You told us to pray that, God. You told us that we may live quiet and peaceable lives. In the name of Jesus, you came to save sinners, that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Let the knowledge of the truth and the rightness of God be revealed, God, in this hour. Grant us wisdom and favor, protection to the power of the Holy Ghost. We receive it, God, for the glory of God. In the name of Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, if you stay with us these 90 minutes, hallelujah. May the Lord bless and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Look forward to being together. Father, we trust you for the for the uh, this part of the country. Father, I just sense we receive. I just sense to do that. We enjoy me, Lord. We receive the understanding of the rightness of God. 
that's being poured forth out of the river of God into this area. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just see that river flowing out of heaven that, that he showed me back in 1978. And in that river is the, is the righteousness of God, the rightness of God that leads to the peace and the joy. It's in the river. It's in the river. We receive it. That's all. We don't have to pray for it to come. It's coming. Let's, Lord, we receive it. Let's say it. I receive it. We receive it. We receive the river of God. We receive the river of God right here in our own hearts, in our own relationships. God, in the churches, we pray for pastors, Lord, that, that truly, honestly, have, have just not walked in me, Lord, all of us, and not walked in the rightness of God like you desire. Let it come in the name of Jesus. We receive it. Others that are in oblivion, we receive it in the church. In the name of the Lord, hallelujah, we receive it, God, throughout our city and the region, oh God. We stand with you against the Prince of the St. Louis that has come against the rightness of God, has blurred it, has confused it. We stand with you, God, for supernatural, for the supernatural dealings of God as it has been willed and decreed in heaven. So let it be in the earth the manifestation of your rightness and the love of God and the peace of God. Hallelujah. Amen. God be with you. Strengthen you this day. Look forward to being with you on tomorrow. As the servant of the Lord ministers and the power and anointing of the Spirit, let it be so. Thank you, God, that your will. Many would come to know you. Serve you. Thank God. Amen. We pray for the healing grace of God. And those who prayed for healing, but asking us on the prayer list, the healing of their body, the wonders of God, break the yokes of bondage, release that now as the rightness of God flows. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.